Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And tonight I rise to object to the Abbott Liberal government's first budget. This is a budget of inequality, a budget that hurts women, a budget that hurts the vulnerable, a budget that hurts pensioners, seniors, parents, carers, low-income earners, children and students. A budget of broken promises and twisted priorities, a budget that's neither fair nor just. In a desperate bid to reshape public debate about his first budget, the Treasurer now prefers to talk about a budget of opportunity. Last week, in his address to the Sydney Institute, the Treasurer said, our duty is to help Australians to get to the starting line. While accepting that some will run faster than others, it's not the role of government to use taxation and welfare system as a tool to level the playing field. Well, Deputy Speaker, that's exactly what the people of Newcastle expect governments to do. We don't subscribe to the Treasurer's dog-eat-dog worldview. Governments have a vital role to ensure that no one gets left behind. That's the Labor view, but the Treasurer's statement exemplifies the ignorance of this government and shows how truly out of touch they are. It's not a level playing field, and that's the reality. Being born a man or a woman, with disability or without, it makes a difference. Being born as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander or not, it makes a difference. Inequality often starts very early in life, and then life circumstances can hit us hard. Many of us are faced with events that are out of our control. This is not a debate about class warfare, as the Treasurer has claimed. It's a debate about equality. In 2014, sadly, gender equality does not exist in Australia. And comparative to other nations, we are way behind. According to the World Economic Forum's 2013 Global Gender Gap Report, Australia rates overall as the 24th most equal nation between men and women. As a woman, you are more likely to have equality in Burundi, the Philippines, Nicaragua, Lesotho, Cuba, New Zealand and Latvia than you are in Australia. When wage equality is considered, we rank 55th with women in Australia earning about 17 per cent less than men on average. When it comes to political empowerment, we rank 43rd and with only one quarter of members of parliament women and about one fifth in ministerial positions. Not helping this statistic is the Abbott Liberal government's cabinet with just one woman sitting alongside 19 men. We need to do better. And the Prime Minister thinks it's okay to promote himself as the Minister for Women, ignoring the 26 women in his government. We do need to do better, and we should aspire to be number one on equity, not languish embarrassingly down the rankings. We should have a woman as Minister for Women, not a Prime Minister who's on the record as denying women will ever be equal. We need to be doing more to improve equality for women, not introducing measures that will send us further down the list. Unfortunately, this budget brings little joy for women. According to Murray Coleman, Chair of the National Foundation of Australian Women's Social Policy Committee, this is a budget that will hurt practically every woman, whether a single parent, unemployed, in the workforce, studying or a homemaker. Very few remain unscathed. The National Foundation for Australian Women, a non-politically aligned group, took to analysing the budget through a gendered lens. Their work was particularly important this year, as the government, led by the Minister for Women, abandoned a standard practice from the last 30 years of government that saw a women's budget statement prepared as an element of the official budget papers. The Foundation's analysis of the budget found it, found it fails the fairness and equity test and that its measures disproportionately affect women. Perhaps this is why the government did not want to report on it. The Foundation highlighted a number of examples how the Minister for Women's first budget affects women. And I'll just go through those now. Firstly, an unemployment single parent with one eight-year-old child loses $54 per week or 12 per cent of their income. Most unemployed single parents are women. A single-income couple with two school-aged children and average earnings losing $82 a week or 6 per cent of their disposable income. For, unemployed women, for employed women, rather, using family daycare, an immediate price rise in the order of $30 plus per week per child is likely. 
The freezing of the threshold and indexation for childcare rebate and fee relied will quickly impact on all childcare fees. The increases may discourage workforce participation. The increase in childcare fees for parents on jobs, education, training, childcare assistance, or JET, um, and the reduction in hours of JET subsidised care available will discourage participation in work and training for low-income women. Cuts to the National Rental Affordability Scheme will impact low-income women who do not own their own home but do not qualify for public housing. Cuts to legal aid and community legal centres mean women who are victims of domestic violence have significantly reduced access to legal advice and representation. And women will pick up more of the cost and stress as they generally take up the role of health manager to our families with the GP tax, increase in prescription costs and pathology and imaging charges hitting hard. Another area of concern is the cuts to higher education. Independent analysis shows that it will be women in our society who will be hit hardest by changes to HEX and HELP schemes, further broadening the gender gap. If the government gets its way and these proposed higher education charges are implemented, a female graduate who takes time off work or reduces her hours to have children will be severely hit by the increase of university fees and the high interest rates, which will see their debt continue to accumulate rapidly as they are earning less. A three-year accountancy degree, for example, will take, um, will take 36 years to pay off for women who take time off to have children, compared to 23 years for an accountancy graduate who stays in the workforce. This prospect of massive and sustained debt will deter many women from going to university and participating in the workforce. Government should be supporting women to study and attain high-paid and high-skilled jobs, rather than burdening them with rampant debt if you choose to if they do choose to study or forcing them out of the university system altogether. It's well known that women have, a far less, have far less retirement savings than men. The Australian Human Rights Commission states that on average a woman's superannuation payout is a third of the payout for men. The Abbott Liberal Government has cut the low income superannuation contribution, a great labour initiative to help boost the retirement savings of low income earners, and 60% of low income earners are women. This, coupled with the delay in the increase to the superannuation guarantee, will have deep impact on women and their ability to retire with dignity. Additionally, the new indexation system for pensions will have dire impacts on retirement incomes. And 55 per cent of aged pensioners are women. I've received numerous calls and emails from women in my electorate who have shared their personal stories and the detrimental impact of Tony Abbott's budget will have on them. Changes to the age pension, superannuation, family tax benefit, higher education and training, these will all disproportionately affect Australian women. In 2014, Australian women have every right to expect their government to address gender inequality. Prime Minister, if you insist on being the Minister for Women, then it's time you stepped up to the mark. You need to reconsider the unfair and inequitable measures in your budget, and you need to take gender equity seriously. It's time you led the work to bridge the gender gap in Australia, not further prize it apart.